pleasure this evening to uh, talk to you, speak to you uh, about food security and indeed food insecurity in, uh, in Africa. I know it's an increasing global problem, but for uh, Africa, it's a really pressing problem uh, at the, the moment and one that uh, is not going away. Um, what do we mean by food security? Well, it's not just the availability of foodstuffs, uh, it's access to those foodstuffs as well. That People may well find themselves unable to access food, even though the food is available, but unable to access because of uh, unaffordability, it could be for political reasons, cultural reasons, a whole gamut of particular reasons. So it's that sense of access to food that's really uh, important. Now, with uh, Africa, um, food security and the other side of the coin, uh, insecurity, is a pressing issue. If we just look at this table of uh, data, and I promise not to overload you with data, but there are two or three tables here I want you to have a look at, <clears throat> we'll see there are world sub-regions where food insecurity, uh, at least in 2017 and estimated by the FAO, um, where food insecurity uh, is, is a key challenge. And you'll see in the table there are six world sub-regions and five of them are African. In fact, all the African sub-regions uh, are represented uh, in that table. And you'll see that Central Africa, uh, about, uh, estimated to be 48%, almost half the population of uh, Central Africa, um, uh, are threatened by food insecurity. And much of that is in Democratic Republic of Congo. But even in other parts, uh, in, in Northern Africa, still 13%. Uh, have uh, have this hanging over their, their heads. And if we look at this next table, which is just uh, agricultural macro data, and if you look at the bottom row there, bottom line, you'll see the population uh, in 2018 was, uh, globally for the world was 7.63 billion and counting, uh, Africa 1.27 billion. So Africa has about 16.6%, nearly 17% of the world's population. But if you look above that in the table, when there are some selected uh, agricultural data, you see that all of Africa has almost 17% of the world's population. Uh, it only has 1.9%, 2 percent uh, of the world's uh, harvested cropland. Irrigated land, less than 5 percent, despite the fact it's got 16 percent of the population. And my guess would be if you took the Nile out of that, it'd be significantly less. And it's a similar pattern for fertilizer use. Uh, as well. And if we look at yields, and I'm using maize here because maize is the most uh, common staple in Africa. I know there are others, sorghum, uh, millet, cassava of course, uh, bananas, plantains, um, rice in, in, in some areas, but maize is the, uh, the, the most widespread, the most common of the staples. And if we look at the bottom line here, the increase uh, between 1970 and 2018 uh, of uh, yields of maize if you look at the global scale, the world increase of maize yields has been 152% uh, over that uh, time period, what, nearly uh, 50 years. In Africa, the rise in yields has been significantly less, only 79%. And if you look at the, de at the detail in the table, you see that in 1970, uh, the world uh, average maize yield was about 23.5 tonnes per hectare. Africa it was 113 uh, tons. And that meant that Africa, that figure of 11.3 uh, tons, was about 48%, just under half what the uh, world average was. But if you look in 2018, that slipped. Africa's yield has certainly increased, but nothing like at the same speed as the world yield. And so Africa now is yielding, on average, about a third of the uh, global uh, yield of maize. But it's not just the um, yield uh, factors that are uh, important here. Up until the mid-1970s, Africa was a net food exporter. Uh, and then around about the mid-70s, late 70s, around about that sort of time, it gradually became a net food importer. And since that time, up until now, um, that gap has continued to widen. And the United Nations predicts that Africa may produce only about 13% of its food needs by 2050. And that, of course, is against the background of climate change. Uh, and the FAO uh, is estimating uh, that by between now and 2050, uh, Africa may experience a, 20, uh, a 10 to 20% decrease uh, in food production. 
uh, due to climate change, in particular more extreme weather events, uh, perhaps new plant diseases uh, emerging in response to uh, climatic changes, um, heat stress for crops, especially in the early stages of growth. So some real challenges uh, here. Having said all that, um, it's very much the case that smallholder agriculture still dominates the agricultural scene in Africa. 80%, 80% of all uh, locally produced food in Africa uh, is produced by small-scale farmers or by pastoralists, cattle farmers, uh, or by uh, small-scale uh, fisher people, not the big commercial trawling uh, organisations. So smallholder farming has been really quite persistent and has some advantages. Um, Dr Boyce and Moyo of uh, Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources uh, is very much a, a proponent of small-scale agriculture. Let me just pass over to Boyson for a moment or two to hear uh, some of his views. Small-scale agriculture is important, first for food security, and it is produced and consumed where it is uh, produced, making it climate smart by reducing distribution costs. In the process of production, uh, at family level, local knowledge is produced that is important to keep the production levels at a significant level. Uh, secondly, uh, it is important in the production of local knowledge. Uh, thirdly, it is important because it employs the whole family and making it so important that everyone within the family utilizes, is utilized in the production process. And as you can see from what Boyson has said, there are some significant advantages in small-scale agriculture. And they generate these kinds of landscapes. You can see on the screen now um, an area, obviously taken from a plane, um, of the Uganda-Tanzania border area. <laughs> I'm equivocating here because I actually don't know whether this is Uganda or Tanzania at this particular point. Um, but what you can see is an agricultural landscape uh, with cultivation taking place, uh, lots of tree cover to provide buffers against soil erosion, windbreaks, um, and also a supply of uh, firewood, managed firewood for communities. And at ground level here in central Rwanda, again, small scale, smallholder agriculture very much dominating the, uh, the landscape. And in Malawi, uh, north of Lilongwe, uh, between Lilongwe and uh, Mzuzu, further north, then we've got this kind of agricultural landscape. You see there in the middle distance, uh, there is uh, maize, bananas and so on, and trees as well, right in the foreground. Again, as before, as wind breaks, uh, buffers against soil erosion uh, and managed uh, firewood uh, extraction. And cattle farmers doing their bit in the drier areas which are less suitable for, uh, for cultivation uh, doing their, uh, their bit. But there certainly do remain key challenges. I think we have to be careful not to think smallholder agriculture has everything going for it. Um, there are challenges. Uh, there's the cost of the inputs to, uh, for, for farmers, for new seed varieties perhaps, or if they want to use fertiliser, that's, that's an expensive, uh, expensive item. We know there are labour shortages at key times, especially at planting times and harvesting times, and there are real peaks of labour. Some communities deal with this by using what they call reciprocal labour, uh, where uh, households help each other uh, with the, uh, the planting. Uh, maybe only take uh, a dozen people uh, a few hours to plant uh, a field. So you help each other, you then do your bit for uh, your neighbours and, and so on. So there are ways of, of dealing with that. Uh, there are marketing inefficiencies as well, both of inputs coming in, but also of those crops that you want to, uh, that farmers might want to sell. Um, a big challenge for them uh, in the past has been crop prices. But it's interesting that mobile phone technology uh, has provided a little bit of a solution to that, um, in that now farmers can get access to prices in the central markets for that morning. They may not own a mobile phone themselves, but many villages, even in remote areas, have access to uh, phone agents, they're called, uh, and you can hire a phone for a, an equivalent of a few pence um, and get uh, the uh, price for whatever it might be, maize or mangoes or tomatoes, that morning. So when traders are coming to do deals with you, you have up-to-date information of market prices. Um, there are issues to do with storage losses. This is really quite an interesting one. Uh, here is in the photograph you can see some maize drying in the, in the foreground just recently harvested. Once it's dry enough, it will be then put into the, uh, the container there 
at the uh, at the back you'll see it's raised off the floor to allow airflow uh, underneath it it's also raised off the ground to reduce as far as possible rodent uh, damage um, but nonetheless uh, the the farmer here um, she, she reported that she loses on most years about 10 percent sometimes 15 percent of a harvested crop studies elsewhere in africa have shown that as much as 30 percent can be lost in storage uh, before being uh, being consumed so there is a view that if if you're able to improve these storage facilities uh, then that would be the equivalent of a, a 10 15 percent rise uh, in uh, in yields uh, without doing anything to the land uh, itself there's also the impact of health as well as a challenge for small uh, holder uh, farmers uh, malaria is at its peak in the uh, early part of the growing season uh, malaria peaks in the rainy season Inevitably, the rainy season, the time when you, you start uh, working on the land, planting crops and so on, uh, at the time of year when you're most susceptible to malaria. And malaria can be significantly debilitating uh, for people. It can also be extremely serious, and it's the uh, largest cause of death for, for children. But even in adults, it can cause death. But uh, it's really that debilitating uh, element of malaria that takes you out of the workforce for maybe four or five days, sometimes much as ten days, at a time of year that you can ill afford be out of the workforce. And HIV AIDS has also had its impact on the rural areas uh, of, uh, of Africa where people um, debilitated by HIV they may be managing it and controlling it by use of antiretrovirals um, but it reduces uh, energy and, uh, and, and capabilities or indeed if that develops into AIDS and people sadly die of AIDS they're taken out of the, uh, the work population uh, completely. And of course I can't finish in terms of illness, uh, diseases, uh, without thinking about COVID-19. Has COVID-19 impacted on these agricultural uh, areas, on uh, agricultural production? The data here are really quite interesting. They, they do relate back to the 3rd of November, so there is a danger that by the time you see this uh, recording, things will have changed. But with 16%, 17% of the world's population, Africa has had only uh, 3.8 percent of the, uh, the the world's cases uh, and 3.6 percent of the world's deaths. What's behind these data? It could well be data deficiencies. I'm sure it is. Data deficiencies are a continuing problem uh, in in Africa. There's certainly a lack of uh, a lack of testing capability. But there are other issues going on here that people are, are really thinking about. And one of these, so the first one, is the youthfulness of the African population. 50% of all Africans are under the age of 25 and we know that young people don't get affected by COVID to anything like the same extent as older people. And 5% of the population is over 65. So that group over 65s who are most at risk from serious COVID, and indeed death from COVID, is a relatively small proportion of the African population. There's also a lack of comorbidities. We know that Conditions like uh, obesity and, uh, and, and diabetes uh, can have an impact on your susceptibility to COVID. Uh, these are diseases that by and large don't exist on any scale in Africa, apart from the two countries, uh, South Africa, Egypt, Kenya, Nigeria. Uh, and it's interesting that of those, um, th those four countries, uh, they tend to be those countries with the highest number of deaths. In, indeed, almost half the deaths in Africa um, from COVID have been in South Africa. Um, there's also speculation among immunologists that uh, Africans may have strong and, and quite active or very active immune systems because they're under uh, attack uh, from diseases like uh, uh, malaria, from, uh, from cholera, Ebola as well in some parts, and therefore they've got really quite active immune systems. And so COVID is yet another uh, attack on the system that's, uh, that's up and ready uh, for them. Or maybe, sadly, the worst is yet to come to Africa. But it is interesting uh, that the World Health Organization, back in April this year, predicted that by uh, June, within two to three months uh, of their statement, that Africa would be the worst affected part, uh, continent, region uh, of the world. The health services would be overwhelmed. There will be tens of thousands of deaths a day. And happily, we are nowhere near that at the present time. So COVID, its impact on agriculture and indeed other aspects of African life has not really uh, come to very much, at least uh, for, the, uh, for the moment. 
Now, with these issues and problems, how can we go about uh, improving them? Um, improving small scale farmers' production. And it'd be fair to say for the last four, five, six, seven decades, there's been a huge amount of effort uh, into identifying production barriers and trying to overcome these. What we might call modernization. What development theory is called modernization theory. That's that transfer of science and technology from the north, in Europe, North America, to the south, in this case, uh, Africa. And, but what works in the north, in Europe, North America may not work in Africa. Much of it has not worked to anything like the extent we hoped it, it might. So there's work going on, has been for the last 15, 20 years, on a different kind of approach, as an alternative, not as a replacement, but as an alternative to modernisation. Engaging with communities, um, working with farmers, and, and uh, working with farmers on their, their local knowledges, indigenous knowledges, some people uh, call them. Empowering farmers locally to take decisions, have confidence in their uh, knowledges. And the kinds of things we've got, uh, this is a, a photograph from a, a farm near Mzuzu in, uh, in Malawi. And what this uh, chap is showing us, you'll see there's uh, what, half a dozen stands of uh, maize growing there. Uh, he's, he, he's experimenting. And you'll see the, uh, the uh, plant in, in the foreground. That attracts uh, particular kinds of insects uh, that feed on the bugs that you'll find on maize. So what he's doing is experimenting and looking at ways of reducing the... Um, the, the insect infestation of his maize by using other ecological methods. And clearly he's quite successful. This is another part of his, uh, his farm. The banana uh, trees in the background there and uh, maize and beans growing uh, in, the, uh, in the foreground. Now, will all this work? There's an economist, very well-known economist, Paul Collier, among others, but Paul Collier is probably the lead uh, in this, um, that has other ideas. And his view is that we should abandon all commitments to small-scale agriculture. Uh, there should be a comprehensive land redistribution, land consolidation, and just support large-scale commercial agriculture only. Get rid of this smallholder sector. That, uh, his argument is that small-scale agriculture is incapable of delivering the food surpluses that are needed. The current system supports inefficiencies. You can't possibly get economies uh, of scale from, uh, from this. Now, we've got areas like this uh, in the photograph, uh, Mozambique, Malawi uh, border. I'm stood right on, actually stood in Malawi and just in the foreground is Mozambique. <laughs> uh, there's nothing to mark the, uh, the border there. But in areas like this, you could see how consolidation of land might actually uh, work. But in areas like this in northern Rwanda, for instance, I think it's more problematic. It's not just the, uh, the, uh, the topography of the, uh, the landscape here. It's also the high densities of population. And so this kind of approach is loaded with risk. Maybe it's worth taking. We can talk about that later, perhaps. Um, but where is this investment going to come from? Is it going to come externally? Um, there are a number of uh, countries uh, in the Gulf states of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the Arab world who are looking to invest in agriculture in Africa. There is large scale uh, uh, commercial agriculture going on. Two photographs here, one of a commercial cattle farm in South Africa and commercial arable farms in South Africa. Um, as you can see there, um, using uh, stubble uh, burning, uh, something that is banned here uh, in UK now. So large scale commercial farming does exist, but is it going to give a potential for, for land grabs for people who do have capital, who do have access uh, to investment? And if it does, that could lead to a significant increase in landlessness as land is consolidating to larger farms, smaller farm uh, holders, small holders uh, will be forced off the, the land. Where are they going to go? Perhaps as labourers on that land for the new landowners, perhaps forced into the cities. We know that in the 18th and particularly 19th centuries in, the, in, in Britain, as people were forced off the land, they migrated into cities, uh, the industrial cities of Glasgow, or Belfast, uh, Liverpool, Manchester, of course, Leeds, Birmingham, Cardiff, etc. Um, but those cities at that time were expanding in terms of industrial employment. So even then, it wasn't a perfect match between those coming into the cities and the employment opportunities available. Most African countries, I'm even going to hazard all African countries, really don't have that, um, 
that, that, that opportunity. So what we could end up with is a rapid growth, even more rapid growth in urbanisation and what one commentator has uh, referred to as a transfer of rural poverty into an urban setting. So this kind of uh, photograph, this, this, this could be anywhere. It happens to be Kampala uh, in, uh, in Uganda and why on earth I'm stood in the middle of the road. Uh, it just beggars belief, but I was and I got away with it clearly. Um, but this could have been more or less any African city, quite frankly, that we've got in, in front of us here. And many people unemployed, many people underemployed in these, uh, in these uh, cities. So we've got these two very contrasting approaches, a smallholder agriculture approach um, in need of improvement, no question, whether it's to do with yields, whether it's to do with management methods, whole different ways. But thinking about that in the context of local empowerment, indigenous knowledges. Or in the other corner, this almost revolutionary approach of sweeping away this inefficient, what's perceived to be, I should say, inefficient smallholder system in favour of large-scale uh, agriculture. There is no doubt that food security uh, is an increasingly pressing problem in Africa. It is globally, quite frankly, but certainly in Africa. Um, but what I would say is, despite the challenge, there is a vibrancy in many parts of Africa today that really gives hope for the future. Of Africans not as victims, all too often the way uh, Africans are represented in the, uh, uh, in the northern media, in the British media, in the American media, is as victims. But I've, over the years I've worked in Africa I've been mightily impressed by Africans operating as agents of change, of their own destiny, of being empowered and doing things with that empowerment. And it's that that gives me and many others uh, hope uh, for the future. I think all of us can do our best uh, to support our African friends and colleagues in, in, in all they do. So I think at that point I really should stop uh, and uh, open to questions. Hopefully you've got one or two and uh, we'll see where we are. Thank you very much indeed uh, for listening. Thank you.